I think if you give up the whole idea of competition, you can actually start to create some really interesting things and you can start to innovate. And it's not really about winning against somebody else. It's just about creating something new and adding value. You're listening to the Legal Mastermind Podcast with your hosts, Ryan Klein and Chase Williams, the go-to podcast for learning from the experts in the legal community about effective ways to grow and manage your law firm. I love to talk about the whole idea of competition because this is something I've been really, really talking about lately. And just in the sense that I see this be such a barrier for so many businesses and law firms. I think if you give up the whole idea of competition, you can actually start to create some really interesting things and you can start to innovate. And it's not really about winning against somebody else. It's just about creating something new and adding value. And so a whole lot to say about this, but I agree wholeheartedly in, in the sense that so many firms operate thinking about what is this other firm doing? And all they're doing in that time is just essentially taking the focus off their own business. I think one thing we definitely want to start off talking about is we know that, Michael, you run an awesome video agency, but you took a ton of focus away from that to create this Game Changer Summit. So can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Yes. So essentially, we're always looking for things in our organization like from the standpoint of one, there's always a few considerations. One, what is ultimately helping us get closer to essentially the vision of the organization? So one of our goals is that over the next five years, we want to help a thousand law firm owners grow by a million in, in revenue each. So in order to do that, we want to be able to make an impact at a higher level than just creating video content or even just marketing video content. The other thing is always kind of the dissatisfaction with the status quo. So we, you know, we obviously attend a lot of legal conferences, speak at a lot of legal conferences. I don't know that there was anybody in the legal industry that was essentially asking for another legal conference. <laughs> I mean, there's no shortage of them. But what I saw was at many of these conferences, and nothing against them, because many of them are actually phenomenal. I mean, they're very CLE driven. There's no CLEs at ours. We actually don't even have that many legal speakers. But what I saw at many of them was people weren't very engaged. They're in the back of the room on their laptop, checking emails. They're on their phones. Like there'd be somebody speaking in the ballroom at a conference and literally everybody's on their laptop and email. You know, they may as well be at their office. And I felt what was missing was like a really comprehensive, engaging experience that could offer very unique insights that a law firm owner couldn't get somewhere else. That was something that was high energy, high production value, something that would really stimulate the senses and focusing it more on a business growth conference, like a law firm growth conference, then here's how you could be a better attorney. It was more about how to be a better business owner. And from that standpoint, it's kind of a niche within a niche you have to think about. But we did the first one about a year ago, and that had uh, about 500 attendees. We just got that in the second one that had 1,000 law firm owners. So the most encouraging thing for us has just been that there's enough people and enough law firm owners within the legal industry that see a need for this and get value from it. But that was one of the main reasons why we started it. It was really just because we wanted to add more value to our clients. So it started off as really just a client conference. And then the other one was just that we just felt that the standard for legal conferences really wasn't that high and that we could do better. I agree. There are two things that I've seen from going to conferences, especially the legal conferences. And I think there are two reasons why lawyers still went to them. And I don't want to like slight lawyeronomics, but there's maybe a reason it doesn't really exist anymore. But it's a lot of speakers are doing one or two things. They're ultimately talking about a lot of things, glossing over some topics and concepts, but never really deep diving into anything. And then ultimately kind of selling themselves. And then also they're giving themselves kind of a big old pat in the back for doing so great and just showing that they're super smart and able to accomplish something that probably other people did. And then also lawyers were going because it's typically an excuse to get out of town. And also they get to hang out with their buds from around the country and go to pretty great cocktail hours with fantastic hors d'oeuvres. So uh, that's <laughs> what I've always seen has been the main reasons. And it's good to see that there's kind of like a, an evolution of that and you may be on the forefront. Here's the other thing I'd add to it. Like we've hosted ours in Atlanta purposefully because we treat ours as a working conference, like meaning that we really respect the fact that somebody is taking a couple days out of their office, flying to Atlanta, getting a hotel room, like investing those two days where they really could be doing anything else and they could be working in their business. So for that reason, we want them to come back with actionable insights that they could apply to their business immediately to make it a worthwhile experience. So we don't do it in exotic locations or Vegas or Miami or anything like that because there's just so many other distractions and things to do that have nothing to do with growing your business. I mean, there are networking opportunities. There is a great experience. It's very much like a VIP experience. But the person that our event is for is the, is the law firm owner that's there to grow their business and wants to ultimately come back and apply those insights right away. It's not for the people that want to just get drunk and then show up this, the next day at like noon. Like That's not really our audience. It's good you're taking away that temptation because all of us, you have your conference agenda. 
And then you're having to walk by an empty blackjack table or a slot machine. And you're like, you know what? This isn't that interesting. I'm in Vegas. I'm going to gamble a little bit and then I'll go. I'm getting, there's just so much to do and there's so many distractions. So that it's really awesome. And above and beyond that, you guys have some really great speakers. I know that you had Gary Vee this past year and you've got Malcolm Gladwell book for 2020. So it's, it really is a game changer when it comes to the type of content you guys are delivering, the people delivering that content. Yeah. We wanted to bring together speakers that could provide a really, really unique perspective. So I think one of the early criticisms we got, especially for the first event, was just that, oh, there wasn't a whole lot of legal speakers. And I used to joke and I'd say like, well, the the last thing you'd want at a law firm growth conference is to have legal speakers, right? So you want to be able to learn from people that perhaps like you don't see at every other conference. Plus a lot of the concepts that we're talking about, whether it's marketing or business development or team and culture or finance or anything like that, that we're bringing together thought leaders and experts from all other industries that can offer unique perspective. Like if we're at our summit this year, we talked about strategies for saving up to a million dollars in taxes. And we brought in one of the top five financial advisors in America, right? So like not an attorney, but could really share unique insights and unique perspectives. Same thing, you know, bringing in Gary Vaynerchuk to talk about social media was something that was a very, very unique speaker, but also at a different level and a different perspective. So that I feel makes the event really unique. And we're, we plan on continuing to do that. Yeah, I remember the first time we heard about Chris, we were at Avonomics or Lawyernomics and me and Ryan were there. We were one of the sponsors and we're like, who are these guys giving away a Tesla? I'm like, come on. <laughs> and it, and we're like, are they really giving away Tesla? And then you get into the conference room and you see the Tesla there and you're like, they're really doing that. And it's just, I think like shaking it up. And I think that's what you've done a good job at Michael is, is really shaking it up and differentiating yourself as a brand and then this conference as well. It, you know, the final thing I'll add to that, so it's interesting you bring up the Tesla because at Lawyernomics, so this was in, I think it was April 2017, where we gave away like the first Tesla. It was like a Model S and it was for, as part of like our client referral program. And at the time, this was the most ambitious, craziest thing we'd ever done. Like my eye was twitching for two weeks leading up to this. We'd never <laughs> given away a car like before. I didn't know how it was done. I didn't know how it would go. I mean, it was, you're giving away a car. So it's interesting to look back to that. And this year's theme at our summit was to play bigger and to play a bigger game. And from April 2017 to now, really the, the summit was in September of this year, we've given away nine cars over the last two, really, you know, almost two and a half years. So it, it's interesting the things that are like that make your eye twitch two years ago are things that are not seen as abnormal, at least within our organization, two years later. It's interesting what happens when you kind of play bigger and continue to kind of shift that as well. Let's continue the theme of shaking things up. I want to mention one more thing I heard. (laughs) We had plenty of friends uh, and colleagues that went to the conference and some of the takeaways we heard about it. And one of the things that stood out to me is uh, one of my good friends said that Gary V came on and said, take all your money out of SEO and put it into social media. (laughs) And at first glance, I said, I don't know what the heck that means, but I'm sure you can probably elaborate a little bit about what he meant and what direction he was going in when he mentioned that. Yeah. So this is one of those things that for the record, we really do. Gary, I didn't know what Gary was going to talk about, to be honest. (laughs) Gary's one of those people, he's never done one, the same presentation twice. And he doesn't actually have a presentation. Like there's no slides. He just, Uh Gary just goes up there and starts talking and then it turns into a Q and a. So it was interesting that that happened in the sense that I think it probably rubbed a lot of organizations the wrong way. Like we have a lot of vendors in the room as well, but it was also something that so many law firm owners thinking about, you know, SEO, everyone used the acronym constantly. And uh, to hear that it represented a big shift. But I also think the point of what Gary was saying, and and I even spoke about this in a presentation later that day, it was just that when you look at it from a traffic cost and a CPM, that if you are not investing in social media, like today, you're doing yourself an incredible disservice, just given what the traffic costs are, the ability to have the level of targeting that you have. I don't necessarily mean that, believe that that means to not do something else that is working and that is effective, but also from the perspective of how people are making, how consumers are making decisions these days, the value of brand awareness and remaining top of mind across multiple platforms, especially in the multi-channel sense, is extremely important. I mean, we filled up the entire summit of a thousand attorneys, uh, nearly exclusively focusing on social ads and social media marketing. We could have invested those dollars in other places, but that was that was how we did it. And for many law firms, whether they're solos, small firms, or even large size firms, it's not really an option for them to compete with TV, radio, and billboards because of the costs involved there and because of the the market leaders in those spaces that are investing millions of dollars in it. But at the same time, like they're not exploring social media with something like SEO. We believe the best SEO, in my opinion, sure, anytime I say anything, there's always someone who disagrees and that's okay. 
That's why I said these are my opinions, right? Shaking so we believe that the best SEO is always great content and content marketing because that's ultimately what's driving good backlinks and that's ultimately what's driving traffic. I know so many people try to game algorithms and try to like do things from a technical standpoint, which I think is important. So there is extreme amount of value there, but it really comes back to, are you creating the right content? But when we think about audiences and attention, today it's social media and mobile. That's what we're seeing in terms of where are most law firms clients spending the most of their time and to not have a presence on those mediums when you're seeing CPMs of like, you can reach a thousand people for $2.50 or $3, it's insane. Like a YouTube six second bumper ad is one cent per view. Like insane to not be investing dollars there. So you're saying you didn't want to optimize anything for best legal conference in Atlanta. Is that what I'm getting? No, because I don't think anyone's searching that. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, <I got> you. <laughs> You'd, you'd more than likely be correct. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's the same thing. I actually talked about this when we talked about on the SEO sense, we did talk about branded search. So meaning that we find that the best clients come from, best clients are ones that know you. So the ones that know you in your firm, most firms, I asked this in the room and nearly every single hand went up that the best clients for them come through referrals of word of mouth, which represent people who know them. And if someone does not know them, they can't refer to them. It's not to say clients in cases don't come from Google and PPC. They do. But if you look at your absolute best clients, most law firm owners would say unanimously, it comes from the clients that are referred to them by either another attorney or an existing client. So from that standpoint, it's like, how do you get known? I mean, social is a great way to do it. But what we're also finding is that when you're driving significant brand awareness across social platforms like Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and Instagram, that the increase in branded searches, so people searching specifically for your firm name, as opposed to DUI attorney near me or DUI attorney Philadelphia or something like that, that increases significantly, but also the quality of that client, the quality of that case is significantly higher when they're searching for you as not a commodity, <laughs> not as like criminal defense lawyer, but they're actually searching the name of your firm and the conversion rates are higher too. So I think there is a lot of value in driving up branded searches. Yeah, definitely. We just uh, did a podcast with Mark Homer and it was all around protecting your brand name. And then we even followed up and wrote, I think Ryan wrote an article about protecting your word of mouth and your referrals. Cause a lot of times we're finding that someone's coming in as a referral, that person searches their, the attorney's name on Google and finds nothing, or maybe finds like a negative review on Avo or something on Google. And instead they're going they that best friend that they had that they referred that lawyer, they're going against what they said, just cause what maybe somebody had one bad experience. So it's, there's so many tactics and so many things that lawyers should be doing online to protect their brand name, bidding on their own name, making sure that they have significant amount of reviews on Avo and Google. There's, and it's, it's easy stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money. And it's really just putting those processes into place. Mm -hmm. Agreed. We see this you know, firsthand. Like, so we would much rather, you see our best clients come from those who search crisp video in Google than the ones that search legal video. I mean, when they search legal video, they could be looking for like court reporting or like a day in the life video or something like that, or something completely unrelated that's not as much of a value as if they're searching for you specifically. And the reason why someone would search is if they know you and if they're familiar with you. And that's really expensive to do with TV, radio, and billboards, but it's not as expensive to reach a frequency of showing your ads 100,000 times to people on six-second YouTube bumper ads, or Facebook Instagram ads. So that's what ultimately you know, was a big push at the summit. It was surprising that Gary Vee spoke about that concept as well. And I'm also the belief that everything works for someone in the country. And we see direct mails work, we see billboards work, we see radio and TV work. So it's never saying like, stop doing what you're doing. If SEO is crushing it, like absolutely do it and continue to invest in it. But it also means that perhaps it could be time to reallocate a portion of your TV budget into social media. That's one of the things we really wanted to discuss in this podcast. Or what are the next things lawyers need to jump into in 2020? Because the, the whole landscape's changing and a lot of people are just being copycats on, hey, main competitors doing this, let me do this. So one thing I know we wanted to talk today about is team alignment, creating a strong leadership and a clear vision. And all those three things I know we spoke about beforehand are really going to help grow internally and I think help separate you from your competitors. And that would really shine through in your brand and how you're conveying your law firm to the public. Absolutely. I mean, so at this point, in our experience over the last several years, we work with probably 800 law firms. And in I mean, work with some of the fastest growing firms in the nation, we've identified certain trends that the fastest growing and most successful firms are doing and versus the ones that may not be growing as quickly or may not be as successful. And I know everybody likes to talk about marketing and they like to know what is that one marketing strategy? Like what is it that I need to be doing? But there's not as much of a conversation around like the people, team and culture and what's going on internally in a law firm. And what I can tell you is that if you get those things right, 
it pretty much solves everything else. Like it basically, I believe that at the root of any problem is people and at the root of any solution is people. So like meaning that whatever it is that you're going into, let's say you say, oh, we have a lead problem. Maybe it turns out that it's actually an intake problem, but you don't know anything about intake. Now you as the firm owner, you can spend a lot of time learning and trying to optimize this. But what if you were to bring on somebody into your firm or consultant that knows all about intake and is able to optimize your intake to improve your conversion rate by threefold. Now, what is really the problem there and what is really the solution? And oftentimes if you find the right who, the right person, that can solve it immediately. I mean, just another example, we saw this firsthand even with our first event. We had never hosted a, a conference before. I didn't know anything about the logistics of this or how to do it. So that would have represented a lot of stress for us and having to figure out how do you host an event, what direction the chairs face, what's the temperature in the room, how many food stations do you have? We didn't know about any of that. So instead, we hired somebody who was putting together several hundred events a year, brought her on full time, and she was able to handle all the logistics of the event. And we, all we had to focus on was marketing the event and the content. So for us, that was a person solution. And I think ultimately, that's, that's everything at the end of the day. And you can trace most problems back to people as well. So if you can get that aspect right, and the reason why we say like team alignment is that if you can get everybody rowing in the same direction, like everybody's aligned on the mission, values of the firm, what are we trying to accomplish here? Like everybody's focused on a similar goal because it benefits everybody together and that you're able to grow together at a faster rate than anybody could individually. So if you could do that, you're going to dominate any industry, in any market against any competition at any time. But that's really easy said. It's like, yeah, how do I make sure that I get 30, 40, 50, 60 people on board and rowing in the same direction? Sounds good, like a quote, but the reality is organizational change is, is tough. It's tough. And a lot of times, organizational change requires like making sure that you've got a clear vision in terms of where are we going. So because you have that North Star, now you'll know that if there's some sort of behavior or value that does not align with the values of the organization or the mission to get there. So for example, when I mentioned our vision, it's to help a thousand law firm owners grow by a million in revenue each. The things that we're doing have to always align with that and helping our clients grow. So it makes decision making much easier if something does not. It's the same way that if you've got a cancer in your organization, that's preventing you from making the impact that you want to be making. And that doesn't align, maybe they've got to go. So it's easy said, but really, really hard to do. And having a team that's aligned and engaged, I'll tell you, is the singular best thing in the world. But you really create a culture, in my opinion, not just by how you hire and the people that you hire that are in alignment with your values, but also by how you fire. So like basically, because hiring a lot of times is guessing. You can have a great hiring process and at best, you'll get like 80% predictability. So having a great process where you're vetting people, but you may not be 100% perfect because you can't control other people's actions or their effort. But when you're firing, hiring is guessing, firing is knowing. You know, you know, and when it's time for somebody to go or they may not be a good fit, but if you can make sure that you've got that clear alignment in the organization, you get the right people on board or the wrong people off the bus, then you'll be moving in the right direction. But you've got to really have that focus on a daily basis. So. I say this in the sense of like, what are the leaders and organizations doing and how are they spending their time? I think there's a few key things that leaders really need to be focusing on. I mean, one is the vision. You've got to be able to have a clear vision that's set for every single person in the organization, in the firm, continuously reinforcing that ongoing all the time. You're the visionary. You've got to consider the long-term strategy, communicate that direction to everybody all the time. The next thing as a leader, it's talent acquisition. So you're being able to hire people better than you and creating an environment or a brand for the firm that it can attract the best people. You know, my view is that you know, when anyone joins a business or an organization, they're placing a bet on their future with you versus somewhere else. So it's making sure that you've got enough there for them to make, be able to help them grow and also make it worthwhile for them. And then the final thing, like I mentioned earlier, is just culture control. You've got to keep the people aligned, get the team aligned. And sometimes that requires a realignment, which means times freeing up people's future. You know, so... Like, because if, if the culture gets out of hand, it's impossible to be like a world-class organization if everyone's not committed to being a world-class organization. Yeah, I've seen like a huge shift with how kind of agencies, maybe like ours, with probably a little bit more with millennials are kind of looking inward and changing things organizationally to see if people could fit some culture, you know, even after they've been around for years. And, and then when you make those shifts, like for example, we used uh, the entrepreneurial organizational system and we just implemented it mm -hmm. back in May. Yep. and it kind of weeded out a couple of people naturally. And now when we're hiring, it's the first time that we're having our interviews, we're conducting hypotheticals, we're looking at the resume and we're seeing their disciplines, what they can bring to the table. But then we're also adding a whole new facet to it 
which is to see if their culture fits or just having them come and meet, keep people on the team and just see even if they gel. And we didn't really do that before. And it's just really important because of the culture aspect. So can you maybe like elaborate on some maybe unique things that you feel you do during the interview process that a lawyer listening would be like, that would be something that I could actually apply to my interview process as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. So we do a lot. We almost, it's almost like the gauntlet in the sense that for every thousand applicants, we are one person. So we're asking a lot up front. And the thing I'll say right off the bat is that if someone's having a hard time with you asking things of them. So basically, you know, we do phone interviews, we do a group interview, we do an assessment that we assign to people and they've got to turn it around in like 24 hours. Like if during the interview process, if they're telling you that, oh, that's unreasonable or, (laughs) you know, you'd rather get that person vetted out before you hire them than to find out once you hire them. So nothing is unreasonable. It just depends on the standard that you set and the type of people that you're looking to bring on board. I think every organization, every culture is different. Our goal is not to be the best place to work for every single person. It's to be the best place to work for the people that align with our values. So I think that's number one. The, the main thing that I see in terms of organizations as far as like hiring and interviewing is that there's just no process. So the same way you would look at marketing, you really should look at hiring. So where you have a top of the funnel, where you're basically acquiring applicants, right? So the people that are applying for roles, and then you can continuously narrow that down through a series of steps to where they can do Video interviews. I think we've used the platform called Spark Hire, S P A R K Hire. They can you can put in some questions. They can do video interviews. There's also like a requirement in our job postings that they have to call in a specific number and listen to the voicemail. The voicemail tells them where to send an email with the resume and cover letter. So if they apply directly through a job posting on like LinkedIn or Indeed or something like that, you know we vet them out entirely just because they weren't able to follow instructions. But basically. If you add those different steps to be able to vet them out, it helps to narrow that criteria for you. And then when we talk about things like culture fit, we have questions that are designed around our core values that we ask people. And they're almost like situational type questions. So it's like, how would you know that somebody would be exhibiting a core value? And we look at it from, if you're familiar with like Patrick Lencioni's books, where he talks about like the ideal team player being smart, hungry, and humble, that those are the three things that we look at when we're hiring somebody that we want them all to be able to meet. So smart, hungry, humble. And in doing so, we've got everything from the assessments, the video interview, phone interview, group interview, you know, some, they'll meet with the team and then like one-on-ones with our team leads and each time we're scoring them. So it's very objective criteria as well. So this allows us to be very systematic about it, but also make sure that we're bringing on the right people because it goes both ways. Not only as a business owner, you can hire the right person for your organization, but you're also making sure that you're the right organization for them. So it has to be something where it aligns with their strengths. They're going to be the right role. They're going to get the support and training and development they need and ultimately be able to grow in the way in which they want to grow and have the growth opportunity that they're looking for so that there's an equal value exchange, if you will, both the organization and the team member. So those are probably the, the, there's some general, I know that's really kind of high level stuff, but I would say that there's probably no greater ROI or greater value than to having the absolute best people. Like the best people are like 10 times better than average people. So it is a, like, if nothing else, like people are an investment, not, not a cost. I know some people are adverse to hiring people because they think, well, I, I can't afford the overhead of hiring an office manager, an intake manager, or anything like that. But what I can say is that one, I don't know anybody who's paid 52 weeks up front for anyone. So you're able to pay pretty much. So think about what your real opportunity cost is if if they don't work out. Like, do you know after 30 days? So maybe that's the real opportunity cost. But two, if you bring on somebody that frees you up or frees up somebody who frees you up, what you're now able to do at that time and how the business is able to grow and better support your clients and the opportunities that offers that there is no greater return than hiring the absolute best people. So I just say that invest in like the hiring process and in recruiting significantly more in perhaps almost at times comparable to what you would invest in your marketing and not skimp there because hiring the wrong person is, you know, the wrong person is always the wrong person. And if you hire the wrong person, then you train them and you develop them and they don't work out and they're not engaged. You got to start over. You have to consider not only just the opportunity cost of that, but what you pay them, the training cost, the time that it takes to bring on somebody new and find somebody new. So that's why we take that process so seriously. So one thing I thought that was really interesting you mentioned is hiring people that are better than you. How do you find that person? I I feel like a lot of times it's like you're looking at a resume, someone starts working with you and someone's never going to do the job as well as you do. So how do you deal with, with sort of making sure that you can kick this person's bad habits, making sure that they're actually going to be able to do a better job than you? 
That's a good question. I mean, I think it really depends on the role. For the first thing, it really starts with like a level of like self-awareness in the sense that I like really good at very, very, very few things, like you know, like one or two things. And I'm like either mediocre or terrible at everything else. And it's understanding that. And I'm even at peace with it because I made a lot of progress this way even years ago, realizing that could I do everything? And at the time I did, I mean, I did everything from our, our sales to our marketing, to our billing, to our filming, to our editing, to everything. I was director of everything. It was, it was a one-man show at the time. But I really focused on what are the things that bring me energy? What are the things that I can really be the best at? And then for everything else, that could be an area of weakness, not a strength. Well, let me just hire other people that, you know, for them, those are their strengths. So like meaning that I like processes, but I don't love processes. But we've hired a, a number of people that love processes. They love creating them. They love writing them. They love being in like in spreadsheets and creating workflows and like that. They absolutely love it but they don't love, let's say like public speaking, or they may not love sales and marketing or something like that. So depending on wh wherever their strengths lie, we have them working in that type of role. So I always look to hire people that are better than me at all the things that I don't love doing, but they love doing. It's a nice counterbalance. The other thing is we've used a number of different hiring assessments. These are, they're publicly available, like everything from like the Wonderlick to the Colby, which is a work style assessment to the print which is also helps around like in, intrinsic motivators. It's all three we give during our hiring process as somebody's moving through the final round and they're an investment to do them, but they give us so much more insight to whether somebody's a right fit for a role, depending upon what that role may be. So if nothing else, I think it just starts with awareness and realizing that there are so many people out there that are like love the things you hate to do and also are way better than you at things that you may be mediocre at. And if you could focus your time and energy on a day-to-day -day basis doing the things that you were either exceptional at, that bring you energy, and are hopefully also help to grow the revenue of the business, you will have a great life. <laughs> what I did over the years was that I would write down all the things that I would do on a day-to-day -day basis, almost like an activity inventory, if you will. And I would write out the things, these are the things that I love to do, these are the things that I'm good at, but I don't necessarily have passion for. These are things I'm mediocre at. And these are the things that I'm terrible at. And I use everything that goes in everything outside of the box that's I love to do and I'm good at. So all the other three boxes, those form job descriptions for people. So I literally would just hire around all the things that don't fit the ideal role. And that's just made things amazing. And at the very least, if you can't start there, at least start by hiring someone to do all the things you hate to do and are terrible at. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we could talk about company culture growth for hours. But unfortunately, we, we usually like to keep the podcast for about 30 minutes. So what's if you want to leave our listeners with any takeaways? That's a good question. So if we talk about growth in general, I think the key takeaway is just to, before you can really grow anything, you've got to have a clear vision about what you want to do and where you want to go. So like meaning that like grow what? I mean, if you want to grow, like let's say we want to grow this year, by how much do you have a specific number tied to it to make it very objective? And to know, is it, did you hit or did you not hit it? And the reason why, like, so clear vision is one aspect of this is having a clear target and having that clearly defined. But the other thing is having a clear why behind it. So like, if you're saying, okay, our goal this year is to grow 10%, but it doesn't really change your life. If you do grow the 10% or not, then if something happens, you reach any point of adversity, you're not really going to care. So like meaning that it doesn't change your life enough to be worth it to be fully dedicated to it. It's kind of like the difference between ambition and commitment. So it's like, we all want six pack abs, but you're going to be at the beach anyway. And if you don't have six pack abs, it's like, whatever, it may not bother you. The same way around the growth goal, if it's like 10% doesn't get you motivated and excited and be life changing, then why would you go for 10%? It's one of the reasons why when we set goals, we set like transformational goals. Like we grew 1500% over the last three years because that was exciting. Not only from the standpoint of push this to innovate because you couldn't just grow at that pace by simply working harder but it also allowed us to really focus on like making a greater impact for our clients. And that was very motivating. And that was very exciting. Not to mention, it changed my life. I mean, I went from sitting in my apartment, $500 to my name, to a team of 60 people in an office. I mean, so that achieving those goals was entirely transformational. And that's where I would encourage people to start in terms of having that vision clearly defined. Because if you don't buy in, like the idea of getting anybody around you or your team to buy in, like forget about it. And then once you've got that, it's making sure that you are focusing as a leader on the right things, like we talked about, which is continuously reinforcing the vision to everybody. You know, it's people, you can't just say it one time or put it up on the wall or anything like that. You've got to continuously reinforce it, focus on hiring the absolute best people you possibly can, and then also maintaining that culture control, like team alignment. And with that, like when you talk about team alignment, the main thing, and this, this is so funny, we, uh, there became this running joke, I forget who started, I think it was like on Twitter or something like that, that the Monday 
after the CRISP summit, because we've seen this now two years in a row, because we talk so much about team building and culture and alignment, the Monday after the CRISP summit is like Black Monday in the legal industry, where more legal professionals get laid off on the Monday following that summit than like any other day in the year. And I think some of that just stems from the fact that the firm owners are they're coming back and they're like, okay, this doesn't meet the standard of the organization we're trying to build. Enough of this, right? So you kind of get this newfound perspective about the fact that the people that are not fully dedicated to what we're trying to do, that are not aligned with the mission of the organization, they got to go. Let's either buy in or get out of here. So those are really the main things. Clear vision, strong leadership, and knowing like where you make the greatest impact as the CEO and as the owner of the organization. And then making sure the team is aligned and the culture is right by not just hiring in alignment with the values, but also firing in alignment with the values. Awesome. Michael, this stuff you're sharing with everybody really is gold. And you've also written a book as well. Yes. wrote a book. It's a primarily a uh, marketing and business development book for law firms. It's called The Game Changing Attorney. And you can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Uh, The website for it is gamechangingattorney.com. So that was a labor of love and spent about a year interviewing some of the fastest growing firms in the country. And then basically shared like the things that they were doing to grow their business in that book. So it's, it can be a valuable read. It's all proceeds for the book. They go to a nonprofit highest, but this was a way for us to be able to get all the things that we had learned in working with 800 plus firms over the last eight years into a book. And what I'll say is that if someone's looking to do it themselves, the book provides basically a blueprint on how to do exactly that. Thanks for listening to the Legal Mastermind Podcast. If you're interested in working with Ryan and Chase, please email mastermind at marketmymarket.com. Make sure to join the free mastermind group for growing and managing your firm at lawfirmmastermind.com. Ryan Klein and Chase Williams are the managing partners at Market My Market, one of the top legal marketing companies in the United States.